Museum in Paris. An imposing door made of bronze. It seems to be swarming with lost souls, all of them sinking into hell. The Rodin Museum at Meudon in the Hauts de Seine department. A door made of plaster. There are only three characters at the top. The rest is an abstract surface with various folds and pleats. Both doors were the work of one man, Auguste Rodin, and there is something deeply mysterious about them. The bronze door in Paris appears the more finished, but is actually a mere first version. Rodin never exhibited it, and it was not cast until 1930, well after his death. The Moudon plaster door seems unfinished, but is the only one exhibited by Rodin in his lifetime, in 1900. Even after that, and up to the time of his death, he repeatedly returned to it and made changes. So, must we regard this unfinished work as a failure? Why was Rodin never satisfied with either version? In this video, we shall try to find out what he was really trying to do. We should also see how this unfinished work became a landmark in the history of sculpture. But first, what is the gates of hell? Standing six meters high and four wide, and containing eight tons of bronze, it makes an impressive showing in the courtyard of the Rodin Museum. It certainly seems to be a door with its two leaves, richly ornamented side posts, and tympanum. And yet, it doesn't open because the figures are too entangled and it has no opening mechanism. The first impression is of chaos, but various groups of characters soon become distinguishable. At eye level, greys are opening and human forms are emerging from them. This is the worldly level. High up, diamonds are brandishing and casting the souls of the damned into the abyss. From the centre of the tympanum, a pensive male character watches their endless, ineluctable fall. This is the supernatural level, also the level of thought. Here, Rodin is giving us not just a door, but a spectacular vision of hell. Why did the subject interest him? His inclusion of certain identifiable characters points the way to an answer. At eye level, a man is crawling on hands and knees like some scavenging animal. He seems oblivious to the dead children who are still clinging to him. The subject is a popular one. Twenty years earlier, Carpeau, another French sculpture, had created a sensation with a similar anguish figure. Rodin and Carpeau are both illustrating the same story, that of Ungolino, a traitor confined in a tower and left to starve with his children whom he ends up eating. Carpot Ungolino is gnawed by hunger, but remains upright, battling temptation. The sculpture allows him to retain his human dignity. Rodin's treatment is even more expressive. He shows us Ugolino's last moments when, reduced to a beast, he crawls over the bodies of his dead children, about to devour them. Lower down, a woman is clinging to a young man's body. This is Francesca, wife on earth of a far older husband who fell passionately in love with Paolo, her handsome brother-in-law with whom she spent days reading tales of the love between Lancelot and Guinevere. Tragedy strikes when the lovers are surprised and murdered by Francesca's husband. Their adulterous passion leads them straight into hell. There was nothing random in Rodin's choice of these scenes. On one level, he's drawing on traditional sources. His door features episodes from Dante's Divine Comedy. This, the first Italian epic not written in Latin, is universally regarded as one of the founding works of world literature. 
it recounts Dante's journey, accompanied by Virgil, to hell, purgatory, and finally heaven. Rodin kept a copy of the work in his pocket, constantly reading and rereading favorite passages. On another level, Rodin is competing directly with other artists in his treatment of popular themes. In 1819, Ingres portraited Paolo and Francesca at the very moment when the deceived husband surprises them. In atmosphere, his painting is redolent of courtly love, and there is abundant medieval detail, a coat of arms, costumes, a richly bound book. In 1822, Delacroix depicted Dante and Virgil on Sharon's bark, surrounded by the beseeching souls of the damned in a scene teeming with anguish, energy and torment. In 1870, Cabanel took up the Paolo and Francesca motif, showing them on their deathbed in a scene filled with medieval imagery. Unlike these artists, Rodin gives us nude characters with no picturesque detail or clearly identifiable decor. Above all, he adopts a far more personal approach to this subject, so much so that Dante's story becomes a mere pretext. This personal approach appears first in the figure of Dante himself. Rodin decided early on to place him on the upper part of the door, crouching, naked and clutching his toes, meditating on the work he's himself creating. But his sketch omits the head covering traditionally used to identify Dante. Rodin actually turns the figure into a separate sculpture, exhibiting it as the poet, the thinker. It is as much Hugo or Baudelaire as Dante. In this way, he turns a real, historical character into a universal poet figure, dropping the direct reference to the Divine Comedy. Francesca and Paolo, too, acquire more general significance. Rodin originally showed another part of the story, the fateful moment when the lovers embrace and the book about Lancelot they left behind. He felt, however, that this instant of bliss had no place on the door. He removed the group, which became the kiss, with no reference to the Divine Comedy. Instead, on the door, he shows the lovers buffeted and tossed by the winds of hell, the punishment reserved for those guilty of lust. There's still Francesco and Paolo, but now, above all, a general image of lovers who refuse to be parted. At this point, we can see that Rodin is no longer setting out to illustrate the Divine Comedy. But this still doesn't explain the overall meaning of the door, of which these figures are only a small part. Indeed, Francesca, Paolo and Ugolino seem pushed towards the bottom, crowded out by the other characters that populate the surface. If Dante's original characters are now a mere pretext, then what is Rodin's ultimate goal? The mystery of this huge sheet of bronze will not be solved until we have answered the question. Circumstances and the unexpected were the first reason for Rodin's being able to stray so far from Dante. The whole story began in 1879 when Edmond Turquet, Secretary of State for Fine Arts, decided to build a museum of decorative arts in Paris. He asked the 40-year-old Auguste Rodin to design a monumental door. The sculpture was given three years to complete it, but the museum project started to go wrong and the state dropped it in 1889. This was undoubtedly a severe blow to Rodin. The door had lost its intended setting. The mold was almost ready, but the money needed to cast the door in bronze was no longer available. He thus had no hope of completing its durable form. On the other hand, he now had all the time he needed to rework it, time to try out new ideas. But let's go back to the point where the work was first commissioned. In 1880, Rodin made a start by producing a huge battery of sketches. He deeply admired the artists of the Italian Renaissance, and particularly two of the greatest, Lorenzo Ghiberti and Michelangelo. His initial drawings show a door divided into eight panels, each depicting a scene from the Divine Comedy. His first source of inspiration is clear, 
Ghiberti's Paradise Door for the Florence Baptistery. In the 15th century, the Paradise Door was regarded as a perfect work of art. Rodin himself remarked, after the gates of paradise will come the gates of hell. The name Paradise Door was suggested by Michelangelo, his other great source of inspiration. Like the slaves modelled by Ghiberti, the figures in Rodin's watercolour sketches embody extremes of physical torment and suffering. Their poses are complex, often theatrical and highly expressive. The 8089 door retains traces of this. The characters tumbling from the tympanum recall the souls falling from Charon's bark. And the entire final composition is clearly inspired by the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel. From the beginning, however, Rodin faces an aesthetic dilemma. On the one hand, the doors shown in his drawings follow an orderly narrative pattern, with characters in low relief, like those of Ghiberti. On the other, those characters themselves embody a vision of hell filled with suffering and movement, a vision expressed with supreme force by Michelangelo. How can Rodin reconcile the two? To do that, he will have to change his working methods. In 1882, he stops drawing and starts modelling in clay using live models. At once, the door's appearance changes completely. The two halves of the original door, each subdivided into two panels, become three large areas, as we see on the second model. This simplification gives Rodin more room for the things that really interest him, the characters and their placing on the door. He furiously models a whole series of characters, some connected with Dante and others not. He then tries out various ways of grouping them, sometimes intertwining, sometimes separating them. And several times the same character turns up in different places. An example is a falling man, who appears on his own and also in the I am beautiful group with a crouching woman, who herself turns up alone a little further on. Rodin himself explained that he wanted to reinterpretate low relief by using of sculptural motifs in different ways. Accordingly, in the same work he alternates characters which scarcely emerge from the door surface and recall Ghiberti's low reliefs, with characters in the round which are all but detached from the background and recall Michelangelo's souls in torment. This combination makes for a more vivid play of light and shade across the surface. But we still have to see what really makes Rodin an innovator. At the time when he was working on the door, sculpture itself was passing through an unexpected crisis. Consciously or unconsciously, Rodin helped it to overcome that crisis. Let's see how he did it. Sculpture has never been more popular than it was in the 19th century, when its role was didactic. To commemorate the great, exalt noble ideals such as peace, or liberty, or tell a story. In the middle of the century, however, doubting voices were heard. In 1857, one of Daumier's caricatures showed the art-loving public flocking around paintings while conventional sculptures gathered dust on their pedestals. In 1846, Baudelaire had already written an article, Why Sculpture is Boring, in which he made a number of specific points against sculpture. First of all, sculpture is an ancient art form, has a concrete quality of objects found in nature, and tells us far less about the artist's imaginative take on the subject. Sculpture's effect is dependent on the spectator's viewpoint and on lighting, but a painting imposes the painter's own viewpoint. Baudelaire thinks a sculpture can work as an ancillary art form, i.e. when it's part of a larger whole, as it is in the gardens of Versailles or a cathedral. Consequently, the worst thing you can do to a modern sculpture is isolate it. This robs it of its artistic quality and turns it into a mere costly ornament which relies 
on the high level of finishing to make an impact. At worst, sculpture becomes art for the living room or bedroom, a horror embodied for Baudelaire in the work of Pradier, which he finds mannered, cold and academic. In Rodin's time, this style is perpetrated in statues like Carpeaux's Imperial Prince in 1865, in which everything, face, sleeve, buttonholes, even a dog's anatomy, is astonishingly lifelike. Indeed, this particular statue was mass-produced and became a bestseller, realizing Baudelaire's fear and what he called trinketization. Rodin's Gates of Hell is diametrically opposed to this trend. For one thing, his characters are not isolated, but integrated within a vast and turbulent whole, and certainly not destined for the mantel shelf. More importantly, however, he helps sculpture to recover its modernity by breaking firmly with the search for smoothness and a fine finish. In fact, the door comprises both parts which are finely worked and finished, like Ugolina's arms, and others just beside them which bear rough traces of the sculptor's powerful shaping fingers. Emphasizing the sculptor's material and physical aspects, Rodin deliberately leaves traces of his passage, of his own energy and individuality. In this way, he refutes Baudelaire. Paradoxically, sculpture can actually become more spiritual and distant itself firmly from a luxury object by accepting its own physicality and turning its back on the lifelike, the polished and the merely pretty. We can now see, perhaps, why Rodin continued to work fiercely on the first version of his door. He wanted to go beyond narrative and find new ways of making sculpture expressive. That is not the end of the story, however. The existence of a second door shows that Rodin is still not satisfied. Having shifted from narration to expression, what will he try to do next? 1889, the end of the museum project leaves Rodin free to stop working on the door. But before moving on, he agrees to hold a joint exhibition with his friend Claude Monet in a private gallery. He needs to make a living, and that means selling his work. The door itself is state property, and so he recycles the characters, removing them from their massive setting, regrouping and later enlarging some of them, and turning them into separate works. Works like The Kiss and The Thinker, which make him a household name. The exhibition is a commercial success, but leaves a bitter taste. Rodin would have liked the door, a major official commission, to be the high point of the Universal Exhibition in 1889. For 11 years, the door is forgotten. The press even calls it a failure. However, whenever the opportunity arises, Rodin again suggests the door. For example, for the Tower of Work, for which he makes a model in 1898, nothing comes of it. The Universal Exhibition of 1900, 20 years after the door was commissioned, brings a dramatic new development. Having failed to secure acceptance of the door for the entrance to the Grand Palais, Rodin organizes an eagerly awaited personal exhibition in a pavilion on the Place de l'Allemagne Paris. He's going to show the plaster model of the door that hardly anyone had seen for the past 11 years. At the last moment, however, he decides to strip the door of its figures and leave it empty. All those who've been expecting the dynamic 1899 version get an all but abstract door instead. There is talk of an organisational problem. Rodin has not had time to position the characters. Very few people realise that the move is deliberate. But why the turnaround? Instead of the earlier door's convulsed and tortured characters, the new one presents an abstract surface which is hard to make sense of. There are no clear focal points, apart from the few remaining characters, undulations in the surface and the three dominant shadows. Declaring that the first door had too many holes and projections, 
Hordanine sits on surface and light effects seeking to eliminate over dark shadows. He has certainly been impressed by his friend Monet's studies of Rouen Cathedral. Some 30 canvases painted at different times of the day and recording the play of light and shade on the facade. The Mudondo can be seen as an attempt to do the same thing in sculpture. It certainly produces subtler light effects while conveying an impression of powerful underlying movement, like the undulating rhythms which animate the paintings of Van Gogh. When someone objects that the door is unfinished, Rodin retorts, and cathedrals, are they finished? He's making it clear that the door is a work in progress. The only group he agrees to put back is the shades. Apart from lightening the top of an unusually massive door, they are one of his most innovative groups. The first innovative element is repetition. All the characters are exactly identical and cast from the same mould. Each is at a slight angle to the others, so the various aspects can be seen at a glance without being viewed in the round. The second innovative element is Rodin's experimental simplifications of forms. Here, he's probably taking advantage of an accident which led to the shades losing their hands. He makes no attempt to mitigate, or still less conceal the amputation. It is stark and brutal. And the effect is reinforced by the fact that for the Rodin as a sculpture, the hands are the most important part of the body, the part through which he works and expresses himself. But even with these dominant and miniature characters, the 1900 door is often regarded as one of the earliest abstract sculptures. Why are the 1889 and 1900 doors so different? And what did the change mean to Rodin's contemporaries? Circumstances partly account for Rodin's last-minute substitution of the later door. Every day he walks through the Universal Exhibition and is repelled by the figurative decoration which proliferates with even the smallest building. On one level, therefore, the 1900 door is a natural reaction against this. But it also reflects a deeper change. Rodin himself has changed. He is no longer interested in telling stories. He wants to focus on essentials. And so he leaves his characters without arms, legs, even heads, if heads are necessary. After all, heads or arms are not needed to depict the act of walking. Between the two doors, Rodin has completed his Balzac. It is a stark, decisive work, as if created in one burst, and expresses one essential thing only, the novelist's creative energy. It shows that Rodin's target is now a powerful, almost primal, aesthetic experience. This puts him at the forefront of the new artistic trends of his time. Expressive force, and not purely realistic aspects, is now the thing that counts. But Rodin is also a symbolist. Instead of reproducing reality, he's trying to convey impressions and sensations. Name an object, said the poet Malarmé, and you rob it of three quarters of its charm. To suggest, instead of showing, now there's a way of giving the spectator more pleasure from sculpture. And so Rodin eliminates most of the characters and gives us a mysterious, turbulent surface which refuses to yield a clear meaning. It leaves us free to react as we choose and is open to a whole range of interpretations. A century on, Richard Serra's works, which refuse to mean anything, do much the same. Like Rodin's abstract door, they suggest lordly totems, indifferent to their surroundings and magnificent in their independence. Bad luck may seem to have dogged Rodin's doors from the start, but time has shown them for what they are, a major work and an immensely fertile source of new ideas. Each contributes something new and important to the history of sculpture. The first version gives sculpture new expressive capacities, which disarm modern criticism, what he himself calls his reinterpretation of low relief allows him to turn his back on narrative and stop aiming at formal perfection. 
Instead, he turns to a more expressive type of sculpture, one that allows the artist's individuality to show through. In the second version, he goes even further. The work becomes essentially abstract. It presents a series of complex, irregular and enigmatic surfaces. And this gives an aura a special aesthetic impact. Rodin's dissatisfaction with those doors seemed to reflect his urge to give sculpture a new intensity, an intensity rooted in the interplay of life and matter. A contrast between his passion-torn characters and an irregular surface that proclaimed its own materiality. A contrast between a mysterious and imposing object and the turmoil of urban life today.